Hello and good day. This is the Bible Bard. A bard is a storyteller who recites traditional texts associated with a particular oral tradition, and I'm here to recite and to amplify what the literature of the Bible says about who is God and who are human beings. Here's the place we're at today. In this lesson, we're looking at the thought that the Bible considers its God the only God. Listen to what the Bible says about this idea in the following sample text. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, the text states, quote, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, unquote. And in Isaiah 45, verse 5, the text says the following, Quote, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Unquote. And then in the New Testament, in John 17, verse 3, Jesus is praying to God and says in that prayer, quote, that they may know you, the only true God. Unquote. These three thoughts are very clear. There's no ambiguity. The thought is the same in the original languages, and pick any translation, it says the same thing. But it is a hard, dogmatic thing to say. The Bible asserts that a being exists called God, that there's only one of these God beings, and that only the Bible's God is truly God. Now, you may disagree with the statement as given, but here's the point. You must admit that what it says is what it says. Interestingly, this assertion was made at a time when no one in the entire polytheistic world had ever heard of such an idea. Then it was written down in the Bible. The Bible Bard presents and elucidates what the Bible teaches. The assertion is that this God has no rival, no equal. We've already learned that God is not man and God is a spirit. Something is ruled out, something is ruled in. And now, we're understanding the Bible to assert that there's only one God. And here's something else. God has given many different names in the Bible. These names are most often descriptions of some attribute of godly being. In many places in the Hebrew Scriptures, God's name is given as the Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D. For example, God speaking in Isaiah 42, 8 states, quote, I am the Lord, that is my name, unquote. However, in the New Testament, Jesus describes God mostly with the name Father. While names in themselves are not the propositional statements that the Bible Bard prefers to present to you, nevertheless, we can learn about God from these descriptive phrases. Number two, the names of God often arise out of interactions described in the Bible between God and humans. For example, in Genesis 17, 1, God says to Abraham, quote, I am the Almighty God, unquote. That's the name he gives. In Genesis 21, 33, Abraham prays and he calls on, quote, the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, unquote. Notice, Abraham adds to the name Almighty the idea of eternal and everlasting in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, God explains to Moses, stating, quote, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah I was not known to them, unquote. So you can see these names are additive. One name gives us some idea of what God is like, and other names add to that information. Here's another very uh, clear example. After God speaks to Sarah, Abraham's wife, in Genesis 16, verse 13, the text states, quote, She gave this name to the Lord who spoke unto her. You are the God who sees me. That's the name in the form of a behavior. Sarah made a distinction. There were many gods in her world, clay, wood, figurines, statues, but she asserts that this God is the God who sees me, unquote. 
We will deal with the names and extended descriptions of God, but first remember that any religion with only one God is called monotheistic. The three primary monotheistic religions are these, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In the Hebrew part of the Bible, the God is the nation's God. The Hebrews, of course, were a tribe of people who marked their descent from three fathers, or called patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are father, son, and grandson. After they got to be about a 70-member extended family, during the next 400 years, their tribal size grew quite large. The Hebrews were later called the Jews. The religion of their descendants alive today is called Judaism. Modern-day Judaism is quite different from the Jews' religion described in the Hebrew Scriptures. But we don't care about any of that. For our purposes, we're talking about the literature of the ancient Hebrews. Number two, the Hebrew religion in the Bible is, as I already referred, a tribal religion. By that I mean that one's association with God, this God, depends upon one's family. A person born into their family is obviously born into their tribe or nation. This tribal character has consequences. The Hebrew scripture provides examples of when a single person did something wrong, but the entire nation was punished. Also, by the faith and righteous actions of a single person, the Bible shows instances when the whole nation was at time blessed. There is, of course, a personal relationship in Judaism between God and individuals, but the national relationship is the foundation of the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, in the Greek part of the Bible, what is termed the New Testament, the focus changes from a family or nation to a exclusively personal relationship with God. The tribe or nation one is born into doesn't matter. This means that a person's relationship to God is a matter of personal conscience and choice. But that makes things harder for things of the mind and heart that only God can see can also offend God, even when those ideas or thoughts do not become external actions that affect other people in society. As we find out more about who God is, we'll see the very interesting changes that happen across the literature of the Bible. In Islam, we have a social and a personal religion. A grown person can convert to Islam and become Muslim, just as people must convert to Christianity to become Christian. But like the Jews, the members of an Islamic society are by birth Muslim and not allowed to convert to any other faith. If a Muslim offends God, that offense is also a social offense and it is adjudicated by a Sharia court, if it goes that far. Because the Islamic society and Islamic faith cannot be separated, Islamic society stretches across the nation state and looks pretty much the same everywhere, which is why we call Islam a social, not a national religion. Among these three groups, there's been quite a bit of wrestling about which part of each group's scripture the others accept change or reject. The Bible part doesn't care much about that. We might clarify some issue if it confuses people, but the Bible part does not explain issues through ideology. For example, people might think it is a contradiction that the same God can require the Hebrews in the Old Testament to fight against and kill the pagan Philistines on religious and cultural grounds. But in the New Testament, the same God can require Christian individuals not to fight when someone persecutes them for religious reasons. These two separate instructions come from the same God, but they are not contradictions. God deals with the ancient Hebrew nation in one way, but later chooses to deal differently with individuals who believe in him in another way. Maybe you would think it would be better for you if God always gave the same rules to all people. But that's just what you think. The Bible Bard is searching inductively for what the Bible declares about who God is, what he is like, and how he behaves. The inductive process takes time, but provides real certainty 
about the answers it finally obtains. Don't be discouraged or chase rabbit trails so early in the process. This is the way the Bible Bard works. Brief recitations, closely focused, no distractions, no rabbit trails. Send the Bible Bard any questions or remarks you care to offer to BibleBardUS at gmail.com. Glad to hear from you. Thanks in advance for following and sharing content from the Bible Bard community. Thanks for listening.